Well, hello, greetings everyone. This is Jyoti Dodia. Welcome to today's session, which is the 81st session in the Power Virtual User Group technical webinar series. And today I'm really pleased to have Ross Cruikshank, who is a developer advocate, and he's going to be talking about how to do artificial intelligence, Internet of Things and machine learning with IBM I. So over to you, Ross. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Uh, hello, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, I hope you uh, are going to be at least pleased, if not uh, excited, by the, the things you can do with an IBM I and all the uh, services that are available on the web and through uh, local systems that uh, I'm hopefully going to be able to show you today. Uh, as Jyoti mentioned in the, the setup, some things uh, might not work in live demo. I'm hoping it's all going to hang together for you. Uh, I'm, a, as, as George said, I'm a developer advocate. I work in the IBM uh, team in London. So I cover the UK and Ireland and uh, parts of Europe. So my role is to show people how you can be uh, working in hybrid environments, linking services in the cloud into your uh, on-premises environments or in, in your own uh, data centers or elsewhere. Um, in this particular exercise I went through a couple of months ago to show how we can use the emerging technology called Node-RED, which is a, a Node.js based application environment to link uh, AI, IoT, uh, machine learning, um, web services, pretty much anything you like, and, and not just from IBM, from, from anywhere, uh, any provider, your your own or third party. Uh, link them together into an IBM I environment and make it easy to consume services through uh, local uh, applications. So if you want to uh, get in touch with me uh, either afterwards or, or during the event, um, by all means, uh, tweet at me, and our crooks there, or you can drop me an email and old style IBM VNet. Um, you can also find me on uh, GitHub, and I've got some uh, repo information at the end. So, so you can, I think I'm showing you today will be via a repository. It's all open source. You can take copies of it. You can try it yourselves. But I'll, I'll take you through a couple of things, one of which was going to be uh, a little introduction to uh, the Node-RED tool. Uh, and I'll show you how it, it gets installed into uh, IBM I using the new open source uh, approach. Um, so both the um, uh, open source pro uh, feature codes so using the new approach using Yeoman's RP RPM packages, and then how to get the, the modules needed to hook into IBM Watson uh, some third-party services and how to invoke the new Power AI uh, vision service for doing image recognition. So uh, and I'll show you how to get hold of a, a free version of uh, AI vision uh, for testing. So you can try it out yourselves. Um, and then if you're really fired up by that, you can talk to one of our partners about uh, getting a, an extended trial or getting one on because you're on. Let me go into this. So the whole idea of this is to, whether it was an IBM I machine or uh, the IX machine, mainframe, um, Windows services, it really doesn't matter. Uh, this is about how to link in uh, some of the services that are being developed onto the cloud so that you can, rather than having to use your own machine to, um, to build and train machine learning, deep learning models, you can start off at least by using services that are being uh, built and deployed onto the cloud. So those services are being um, adapted all the time. They're being used and um, mistakes and bugs fixed all the time. So they're about as, as good as you can get uh, to get you going. And the idea behind them is to allow people to consume the capabilities of AI without necessarily having to get into the, um, the underground pipe work of um, building and maintaining them. So I so, uh, hope to give you a way of getting going uh, on an IBM I machine. The the work that we that I my department does is um, around creating content, getting it out to uh, communities, building code, 
uh, and making it available online. So any of the things that I'm doing, you'll find it are available through the IBM uh, developer.ibm.com, uh, where we bring in things from the labs, from um, we'll do workshops around the world. So there are people in my role in the Asia Pacific region, in India, in the US, rest of Europe, Latin America, wherever you are in the world, if you need um, to get hold of somebody uh, who can help you get into the adoption and enablement around uh, use of the technologies, give us a shout. You'll find us at developer.ibm.com. Well, enough of the plug. Here's some uh, handy uh, links. You've got those in the, the PDF, which you'll be able to pick up. There's some uh, information that you'll find that's IBMI specific. Um, there's some tutorials around using the Power AI Vision and um, the articles about some of the Watson uh, language services. Um, so I'm going to be taking bits and pieces of uh, Node-RED, uh, IBM Cloud, where the, the Watson AI, uh, APIs live. I'll be doing some things with the uh, Power Developer program, um, instances of Power AI Vision, setting up a, a three-day trial service so that we can uh, kick off a, an AI vision service, train it with images of our own, so we have our own personalized image classifier, and then embedding it into an application on IBM I. Um, we'll do a variety of things with Node-RED, but mainly it's going to be uh, integrating AI, integrating um, some internet things as well, which will show how easy it can be done. Turn your IBMI system into either a consumer of uh, Internet of Things data or a producer or both. Uh, we'll do a little bit with uh, DB2 for I and uh, the, the new IDB connector and how that can be used through Node to uh, allow Node-RED to talk to your uh, local DB2 for I. And this is kind of an overview of what will be built over the, the course of the, the next hour or so. Uh, as Jyoti said, if you've got questions, um, by all means, uh, stick your hand up in the in the chat and ask away. And uh, Jyoti has uh, full uh, permission to interrupt me and uh, let me know if I'm wandering off or if there's some uh, burning question. But we'll be doing a little bit around uh, Power AI. I'll set that up. We'll do some Watson vision recognition. We'll have a Watson assistant, which is the capability on uh, the IBM Cloud to do chatbot backends. I'll show you how to do some on-the-fly uh, language translation uh, so that uh, if you've got messages you want to convert, you've got text you want to convert into uh, an arbitrary language, you don't have to have done all of that uh, on your machine. You can do it on-the-fly using a translation service. Um, so you can do ad hoc translation. And uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of interaction with uh, the SQL services through the DB2 fly. Uh, I'm not going to assume you know much about Node-RED, so I'll do a little bit of a tour, um, show you how it, how it looks, what you can do with it. Um, the main thing here is that it's a service that runs in the PACE environment on IBM I, so it's running with the uh, Node implementation. So it's on top of that, it, uh, it actually runs within a, a pace runtime. Which means it can do pretty much anything that you could have done on an AIX machine uh, or any Linux or um, uh, operating system that hosts Node. Uh, it's a flow-based programming tool. For this example I've got on the screen here is how you would do a chatbot. Um, this is one that is implemented on the, the demo, which I'll show you. Um, the idea being that you, rather than coding uh, how you want things to work, you just hook in the bits that you need. You'll see where it says there's a, a unit here called Chatty. That's a link out to a chatbot service. The blue one that says Translate is take some, some text and run it through a translation service, get the results back. Uh, we've got some templating nodes, so you can do HTML formatting or JSON formatting, pretty much any uh, formatting of the data so you can uh, return it. And because Node.js uh, normally comes with uh, a thing called the Express middleware, 
That means it has a built-in web server capability. Um, the two endpoints on the left-hand side with, with uh, slash chat, get and post, that means this, this can act as a server for uh, web APIs and act as a page generator. And then the HTTP node over on the right-hand side is the response. So if a browser talks to it, that's the part that sends back the values uh, to the browser. And the idea is add on function as you go. It's very uh, ideal for doing incremental development. And it means that when you want to explain how things work, you don't have to go in and analyze the code in quite the same way. You just look at what the flow is. And it's, it should be fairly straightforward to identify what's going on. So we've got another, another example here. This is the image classifier. Um, we'll have a look at that one in a second where uh, this uploads an image, sets the payload into the right format so that we can send it off to the visual recognition system. And that would be the IBM uh, Watson vision recognition. We also take the results of that and send it off to an AI vision service, which will be a custom classifier so we can get um, more relevant information or uh, once you've tried out the, the visual recognition system on the cloud, you can build your own locally um, to do things much faster or to use uh, private data. So one obviously uses uh, needs the data to be sent off to the cloud server. If that data can't leave your network, then you can use a local AI vision service to do the same kind of thing. And you can work out the training to make it look nice. And then down the bottom, we've got some um, uh, templates for doing how we do the classifications and then sending back a result. So hopefully you'll see the model and I'll show you how to build these together. And then finally, there'll be a little bit of a, a, a integra integration with the not only the db 2 fry but also uh, the IFS as well. So we'll have to create files on the fly in the IFS, read back the data, which retrieve data from db 2 fry do updates if we want to. All with uh, nice simple uh, flows so you can see what's going on. Okay, the Power AI one I'll cover in a second, but what I'm going to do is switch out from here and switch over to Node-RED so you can see what's going on. And while so, Ross is just switching over, just a reminder that if you have questions, please post them into the chat window. Select to everyone rather than just to me um, and add in your comments or questions into the chat window. Thank you, John. Let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. So um, this is Node-RED, and if you're interested in where to get it, it's at the Node-RED site is node-red.org. This is all public domain, uh, community-developed software. Uh, IBM started it as a, an Internet of Things um, event processing tool, uh, and built it around Node as, as Node.js was becoming popular and uh, decided that actually the, the ability for IBM to keep up to date with all the uh, devices and protocols that were uh, being adopted over the last five, six years was becoming unmanageable. And to make it accessible, we open sourced it instead and allowed the community to go off and uh, add the bits that they needed. So you will find uh, community developed applications tools and these nodes, which are those blobs that you link together within the application itself, are in here. You can you can find things to do with lights. You'll find things to talk to uh, Philips Hughes. Uh, there are Aurora lighting systems, uh, E lights, uh, Pro lights. These are for home management systems. You'll see uh, contributions where the, the green ones here are flows. So these are ways to put things together rather than um, like the code to uh, integrate with a particular kind of device. So have a have a rule around there if you're you're interested in a particular kind of device or mechanism that you would like to integrate into Node Red. Um, it also has nodes for third-party services. So you'll find there are links here for things like Azure. There will be Amazon, so you can link in 
Amazon services. You can pull in things from S3. You can talk to Alexa. Uh, somebody's built uh, the services to do it, so you can bring them all in. So there's there's virtually nothing left here that is IBM specific. Um, the whole community puts in what they want. And obviously the documentation will tell you how to get started, how to install it, depending on which operating system you're on. And because uh, it started out as a, an IoT and, and lightweight uh, development tool, it's become very popular on things like Raspberry Pis. So there's some specific information about how to install with a Raspberry Pi. It's, it's, uh, it was included with the, the Raspbian operating system builds until the summer of this year when they decided that Raspbian was getting too big, um, but it's now one of the optional modules you can install. Uh, it was originally part of the desktop uh, implementation. So that's where all the, the node red stuff is. There's uh, lots of help uh, available on the web, lots of community. But what I'll do is I'll switch back over here and show you some basic stuff as to how it works. And Ross, we'll, would, yeah? would it be a good time to ask people, you know, the poll as mm. to how many people are using node red and anything else that you wish to ask Definitely. and just enter yeah. um, the answers via the chat window that would be great yeah yeah i'm interested if anyone's if this is new to everybody um or if you've seen it all before um then i can skip right past and go to and we can do things and while you're answering i'll do a very simple hello world so you can see it uh, if you've seen it before then that's fine if not then it might be interesting you drag and drop things from the palette. There is generally some inputs down this side, some standard outputs, and you'll see the things like MQTT, HTTP, TCP, so you can do raw sockets. And there's also, because I've installed them, some um, IoT nodes here as well. And then people who may have been familiar with Scratch might recognize this. This is little modules for doing standard programming functions switches, changes, so this is modifying variables, moving data around, uh, testing, so this is a switch for testing and splitting. And then there's some functions in here which are really quite common uh, operations when you're processing array data or data streams coming in from uh, files, web pages, and so on. Uh, eventually, people figured out that you, you would get enough HTML coming in that you want to find a standard way of processing it. So someone's created a, a node which you can now allows you to process HTML data. Ross, right. most of the uh, answers coming back is that Node Red is new. Okay. Um, so oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. All right. So what we do, these nodes you can just drag onto the palette and you'll see a whole raft of them. These are the Watson ones, which I'll cover uh, in a little bit. But these have been built all open source, so you can install them uh, as you need them in any environment. There's some standard ones that come off the shelf, if you like, with um, each installation. It's a slightly different set. So if you install on a, uh, a Raspberry Pi, you'll get some extra bits because it knows it's on a Raspberry Pi. This one is on an IBM I, and Node Red doesn't have anything. Uh, particular in the way it installs that makes it aware that it's on IBM I, so you have to add the extra bits you need. But, uh, the stuff here on the, the top half of the left-hand side is pretty standard. So all the, uh, the yellowish nodes in there in the functions, and all the, the inputs and outputs are standard. The social media integrations are uh, standard, so you can talk to email servers inbound and outbound. You can make yourself into a, like a mail-in server if you wanted. Uh, and then these files talk to local file systems. And as it turns out, without any, without doing any uh, work at all, it means it can talk directly to the IFS as well. And then this db 2 for i node is one that uh, you can optionally install. I'll show you how to do that, which lets you build queries to db 2 for i uh, this, these ones here are for doing some things with Cloud Object Store and uh, the image uh, classification example I'll show you uh, also stores the images into the, uh, the Cloud Object Store uh, in IBM so that you can go back and revisit your, your analysis if you want. So 
here's a, a very the simple hello world version of uh, node red you've got an input this is a, a way to create an event uh, without having external data flow coming into it you can just create this thing called an inject node um, all the the node red nodes generally have this format where you pop up a little configuration panel so the idea is to limit the amount of code you have to do it's it's been classified as a, a low code uh, environment it's not no code but it's very much a, a low code tool um, you configure panels that means it's difficult to make mistakes that means it's uh, much easier to get uh, applications working quicker because uh, it's not reliant on your your necessarily on your coding abilities you'll get these little drop downs that tell you the things that you can do in this environment so we're going to put a string I'll put hello world and Welcome, EVDD. So this one is a timestamp, but it's actually also driven by um, on a cron job in the background. So you can actually have it inject things on an interval basis as well if you wanted. So you can switch it into a an event clock uh, and uh, change the the way things work by adding new events at different times. That changes the node. You'll see this little blue dot appeared here. That says that's being modified. And then over on this side, up at the top, you'll see this deploy button has become red. That means the things that I think this application is doing are not the same things as what we've just configured. So there's a difference between what's called the runtime version and the editor version. And you'll see the message payload here. Uh, this is for debugging, and you should use debug nodes wherever you want them. You can attach them into any flow at any time, and it will show just the data that you've selected. Um, you can, by default, all the messages that flow between nodes, uh, the expectation is the data will be in this payload property. Um, I will assume it, that you know about JSON. If you don't, um, go, and, go and learn about JSON. It's going to be um, the kind of uh, the interchange format that makes uh, APIs uh, much more popular. Uh, XML did a fantastic job, but it's become quite um, quite cumbersome in a lot of cases. Uh, JSON's kind of taken over as the a lighter weight data representation layer. So we represent things here as JSON object called MSG message. And the messages flow between nodes with the bulk of the data that you expect to process uh, in a, a, a field called payload. Let's just turn my phone off. All right, I thought that was already off. So what we do here, when we want to actually say, now take what I've just changed and make it go live, we click the deploy button. This is because of something else I'm doing, so don't worry about that. What you get normally is successfully deployed uh, that means it's updated the runtime you'll see deploy has gone less gray now so we're, we're looking at what's live so if i click this button now you see there's this if i hover over it it changes color that says when i click on that it will actually inject an event into the the, uh, the application now the application as far as this flow is concerned this orange flow only has one other place it can go, and that's to the debug. And the debug pops up over on these windows here. So we've got a debug window that shows what this data is flowing through. And you'll see the hello world, which is fine uh, in itself. That's great. But um, that would be uh, more useful if you actually had a way of interacting with it from the outside. So I'll show you if we wanted to turn this into a web server that did the same thing. We would do, uh, let's create an HTTP node. So this is an incoming request within a hello. This will let me ask this application to give me a response to my request on the slash hello. And I'm going to take the data that was in here. So this is what I want to come out in the message. And I'll put it into a little template node and the template node has 
the ability to replace some text, but we'll just put the data there. And now I can do that. Because it's an HTTP in, there has to be an HTTP response node so that the browser that made the request or the application that makes the request gets an actual result. Um, so there has to be a way for the, the, the data to get back out again. This normally doesn't have much to do with configuration, but occasionally you have to do some configuration here around um, uh, setting headers to allow things like uh, cross-site invocation, things like that, cores. So now, this will, that little bit, for this, for this to work, the only way I'll get an answer is if I invoke this uh, hello endpoint and invoke an answer. So what I'll do, here's my URL for the host. You'll see it, Node-RED normally runs on port 1880. I'm gonna pop that into another window. And I'll put slash hello. And there's my hello world. Um, not too exciting, as you were expecting that to happen. But what I can do here is add in another little bit and I show everything that's happening that's being sent out to the user. So you see, it's not just the simple request that comes in. I redeploy that now. And now go back here. If I re refresh the page, I get the same answer. But in the application now, I've got this information. Now you see, as I put my cursor there, that that block in the middle, the, the message, debug node has got this little orange line around it, orange dotted line. That says that that debug message comes from that node. If I move it up, you'll see the, the orange line moves between the different debug nodes. So what you can do is once you've seen the data that you want and it's coming out right, you can actually turn off debug by clicking on the, the output there. And that sets it normally to not respond. So when events are created, you don't necessarily get debug, which allows you to just see the things you're working on. You'll see this little twisty shows you how to get into the data. And that will expand the whole JSON message object. And you'll see in there, there's payload, but you'll also see the original request that came in. This comes from the Express middleware. So you've got your access to what the web server part is saying uh, has been created. So there's your the original URL. You get the, the query, the parameters, if there are any that have been added. The body that's come in, Obviously, this is a, not a particularly exciting one because all we're doing is invoking the URL. But if we were to do the same thing, but actually put a query on it, is text equals, uh, some data, the same answer comes back because this application is set not to do anything with the parameters. But if we now look down here, so the new message that has just arrived in the request, we should have a query and it's parsed out the parameter name and its value, which means we can access it in the application. So just in case we wanted to do that, we can now use a thing called Mustache. Mustache is a templating language that's used uh, quite a lot in uh, node-based applications. Um, you'll see it as handlebars, mustache, HTML bars. Uh, there's a whole variety of tools based around this mustache formatting. But essentially, it's called Mustache because of these little uh, braces, like sideways mustaches. Um, and we can now refer to the message property for rec, the rec, which is up there. Let's see, it was the message dot rec, req dot query dot text. And then we can act by navigating through the object into the output. So hopefully, if I do this again, we now get that's the new text that appears. 
if I don't have any text, then it doesn't display it. So it'll put it in if you have it. What it won't do is fall over and, and die horribly because you've referenced some field um, in the message that doesn't exist or is not populated. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that Node-RED's become so popular is it's really quite uh, tolerant of people learning what they're doing or not knowing what the data looks like until you've brought it into your application. So um, quite often with IoT data streams, you don't know what the full structure is until you get your first device online. Um, and then you'll see the input coming in and you've got to figure out what it looks like. Node-RED made it really easy to navigate into the data, work out what you needed, and extract the information you want. So I'll show you how to do uh, some IoT uh, in a little while. OK, so uh, everybody got an idea now of how Node-RED works. Um, obviously, you can play around and navigate. There's some cool bits that you, you can do in here, which I'll just show you as uh, application development accelerators. If you bring in a node and you hover over an existing uh, net a connection, drop it in, it'll automatically insert it and stitch things in. So you can do this incremental development by just creating. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, you can create uh, reformats. You can extend the, the data if you want by just dropping them in. Unfortunately, it's not clever enough to put things back when you take them out again. And you can just uh, add and delete things. So the message.payload in here, a change node. So instead of you saying in your code that you want to change things, you put in a little flow uh, to say, I would like to change things in here. And that means Hello, Ross. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. I was just going to add um, whilst you were showing that, it reminded me uh, of that time in Hursley when I came to um, see some demos and I had a particular request about audio and how you could, you know, convert that to text or yes. figure out whether there was a particular sequence of numbers in an audio file. Mm -hmm. And um, you very easily and simply put some modules together on this Node-RED and pointed and clicked and, and out came an answer. And I was amazed at how quickly um, it is, easy, you know, fairly easy for you to yeah. go through this and set something up, a very simple sort of uh, example demo application. It's, um, it's really easy to, uh, to pick up um, if, if there's a node exists. Uh, so if someone has um, created a node for doing something, uh, you can, in, with the right version of Node Red, you can try and find it before you start. So if you wanted to look for audio, there's a whole load of audio objects that you can install here uh, for handling media. Some of them are for playing audio. Uh, some of them are for recording audio and then bring it into the application as, a, as an audio stream. You can do the same with video. Um, with image, uh, there are people that have uh, created uh, video processes using FFmpeg libraries that allow you to um, process the data directly within the application. So you can use video. You'll see there's lots of video utilities, um, encoders, I believe, is there an MPEG one? Yeah. So there's uh, some keyframe analytics if you wanted to extract keyframes from a, a movie. So that's often done for things like uh, creating uh, closed captioning. If you've got your own uh, video, you can uh, capture the audio from the FFmpeg and you can then put keyframes from the video stream, capture those using this tool, and it'll uh, then be able to synchronize uh, sections of the, the your video recording with the audio um, closed captioning. So really easy to do. And there's a whole load of flows that are shown in the, the Node-RED um, site, which will show you how to do that. If you'll have a look over in the flows, we wanted to do FFmpeg, for example. Here's, um, these are samples, the green ones for 
Thanks for, for processing them using, so this is uh, watch and speech to text and text to speech uh, on Facebook Messenger. So you can chat or through audio to Facebook Messenger and then have it go off and do a chat bot in the back end. So I'll, I'll show you how you can link those in uh, when we're talking to the, the Watson APIs as well. So thank, thanks for that, uh, uh, Jyoti. Um, there is a question it. about um, Node-RED and um, how it's deployed. So is this deployed on IBM I? So maybe you yes. can um, just cover that. Yeah, so just to prove things are, are actually happening here, um, this is the actual IBM I instance that's running. So you'll see it's running. I'm, I'm running with QSEC offer, and I apologize for that, but uh, I was doing this for demo purposes. You would not do this at home, but um, just for the, the, this is a closed machine. It's, it's running on a private network in IBM just for demos. Um, so it runs with QSEC offer because it's much easier to do that. Um, and I apologize again. However, you'll see it's running uh, Node Red. It's running version 18. There is now version 19 now. So that'll do, next thing I'll be doing is an update. Uh, the Node.js version is Node.js 8, which is the uh, long-term support version currently, and that will move to version 10, uh, the next iteration. We're running on uh, 7.3, 64-bit machine. Um, so this is running as a, a virtual machine in a, a reasonably sized machine, I think it is, Power 8 machine in uh, IBM Hursley in Winchester. Um, you see the configuration. It's uh, it defaults to using some uh, Raspberry Pi stuff because it it knows it's not Windows and it tries to load them, but figures out that there's no GPIO. We're running under the, the home directory of QSEC offer, and uh, here's the the port that it's running on. So in my other window. Uh, I can invoke some of the services from it, but let me do our work active job. Uh, and also QSAC offer uh, ID, and you'll see we're running the shell on QSAC. There's node rat, and node is the the service running. Oh, that's that's where we sit. It's it's running lo uh, natively on the the machine, and we will be interacting with it not only from the outside, which is what this Node-RED application is doing. This app, you'll see that that IP address, that is the IP address of the IBM I machine. So let me just show you a quick switch over here. You'll see here, if I run the, this is a, an exec node, so I can run commands within the PACE environment. And I'll run the Unix uh, command you name mine say which it says, tell me what you've got in here. And here's our string here. So that's the, the OS. We're running 7.3. Still don't know why it does it that way around, but it has done for years. And that's machine ID. And we can bring out some path information. And you'll see this is local to the machine. We're picking up uh, from uh, QOpenSys. We've got the OpenSys packages Node.js 8 is in our path. So all of this stuff is running off the running out of the IFS uh, on my uh, 7.3 machine. So, but you will see nothing that uh, in Node-RED that isn't running on IBM I. I did think about showing you it running on somewhere else, but you can do that anyway. So this is only running IBM I. Any of the other services, of course, they're going to be in um, in other places. Uh, so the the Power AI Vision runs on a, a virtual Power Linux machine, which I'm about to spin up, and the Watson services are running in the IBM Cloud, um, either in Dallas or Frankfurt, depending which ones I'm using. Okay. Hopefully that that answers your question. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, queue customer data um, sample files on IBM I, um, this is going to go off into the QIWS library. Do a select 
uh, from that file. It's just going to read back all the records. You do an inject, it goes off, forces it to do the SQL query into DB2 for I. And you'll see it's running on star local with QSicker for authority. And again, that's because I'm lazy. And you'll see in here, we get a common style uh, of response from things like a, a list server is going to be an array of values. So this will have all the column names that are defined in uh, that library, and then all the values that are available. This is really not doing anything clever other than doing the, the, the query. Um, it formats the response, so I could call this from uh, the outside. Let me just show you that QCUST. QCUST. Pretty, pretty, but uh, we can add the we can now format that data in any way we like. But the fact that I've invoked that QCUST CDT flow. This has set the uh, the payload for the query to do the select. The DB2 query goes off to my star local machine, and this does the response. And this is very simple HTML formatter. If we uh, if we knew the um, lat longs, we could put it on a map if we want. We could put a link to a map, and um, for the moment, this just puts it up into different rows, and the little test here is just to see whether it was invoked with a message or a request from the website. Uh, the message.rec has a value. If not, if it does have one, then it sends out a response. Uh, if it didn't, that's probably because I'd invoked it from down here. Uh, but whatever happens, it also sends out data to an IFS file. And it just overwrites the file each time there's a query, which means I clear this out. I can just generate request. This is a timestamp, which means it doesn't really do anything. And now I can read back from that data set. Do a little bit of uh, formatting, which says take the data that comes back from the file and convert it into a JSON object. And then it doesn't send it anywhere else. It just puts it straight into debug. So that's the data coming back now. Instead of it coming back from the database, it's coming back from the IFS. You'll see that that's coming from the, the message node after reading back from uh, the temp uh, IFOG data file. So you've seen it now talking, hopefully believe it's running on IBM I. It can talk to the local SQL databases, but it can also talk to the local IFS files as well. Uh, there is actually a connector, uh, which I'm not going to show this time around, but which uh, talks to the uh, XML service, the iToolkit, which gives you a, a node API layer to talk to data queues and invoke applications and so on. But uh, I'm not planning to do that today. I'm going to do that for another workshop. OK. Um, I've sold you on the idea that that's working now. Um, what I'll do, I'll flip back to the, the main deck and just carry on from where we were. I'll show you the, the IBM I, sorry, the Power AI uh, setup, and because it takes a little sec a few seconds to get it going. So uh, Power AI is a, a an entire environment that's been built to make it easy to do machine learning using uh, Linux on Power. Uh, it needs uh, the engine itself needs um, the uh, NVIDIA GPUs, so you probably would need to get one of the AC922s or the older uh, SA22LC uh, cloud machines. But you can also use it on IBM Cloud now. You can get into it through what was called Bluemix. There's a, a Power AI uh, service, and you can use the Power Developer platform with the uh, an implementation that gives on to the NIMBIX cloud. So I'll be using the, the PDP NIMBIX one uh, for the, the next few minutes while we do a demo of that. Right, so it can do uh, object detection uh, and image classification. So if you patch the uh, video stream, it will actually do live 
um, uh, object detection analysis. So if you've seen any videos or news coverage about um, intelligent video processing, you've seen my video streams with it, um, putting little bounding boxes around people and cars and traffic analysis and so on. Uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, Prior AI Vision can do. I'm going to show you how you can use it as a quick and easy image classifier, which means you could use it in, uh, in a warehouse for recognizing whether there's a uh, forklift is in, in the wrong place, uh, whether you've got empty shelves, if you've got uh, continuous image scanning, you could use it for warehouse stock level monitoring. Um, you could use it for vehicle tracking, um, people monitoring, all kinds of things, just by looking at what kind of content is in the, the image. So I'll, I'll show you how you can do that. There's a link down here for uh, getting going if you wanted to learn about uh, doing Power AI. What we'll do here is sign up for the Power AI Vision as a service. So there's a, there's a three-day trial if you've got an IBM ID and uh, Partner World membership. Um, which is really not that difficult to get. Um, but there's no requirement on you to do anything with a, a Partner World membership other than just sign up. Um, you get one free trial, one free three-day trial, and uh, after that, you're, you'll be prevented from getting another trial. Uh, so I'm now on my fifth user ID because I keep using up all my trials, but I've got one for today that I can show you in action. Um, what we'll do is set some training up. So wh whether it's using the trial or whether you've got the, the live system of, on your own uh, power machine, um, it's a very simple interface. Create your data set for training. You train the system with example images. Um, so you're not really getting into how uh, the deep learning engine works, but pick some images, train it, and then use it as a, a web service to classify things. You, get, uh, you train it in uh, how to do the classifier and uh, a group of uh, classes that you want to, or categories that you want to detect. And uh, it'll give you an idea of the uh, accuracy of the model that it's built with some, train, uh, some testing data. And then you do a little bit of test and then publish it as a service. So what we'll do is get that going as well. I'll switch back out of here. So let me set one up. It's on the other one. So I set up the tri uh, trial yesterday, and all being well, this is where the live demo bit kicks in. All being well, I should be able to get to the end point. And because of the way this works, uh, you will see that it tells you how to get to the data set environment but it doesn't put the ip address in and that's because this ip address or this name of uh, the machine changes every time you suspend and restart it and if you leave it idle for a while it will get suspended and then it will relaunch because it's coming up in a container it relaunches it but assigns it whatever address is available so when i resume this that ip address is almost certainly not going to be 189.45, uh, it's going to change to something else. So this, this takes a second to do for it to uh, complete the launch. And that's now moved to 189.54. So we need to keep that. Save that. And then we need that address. In here. If you haven't done too much web development, then you won't have experienced the amount of copy and paste that goes on. But this is the normal uh, for web development. So now I have the address of my admin console for doing things with Power AI Vision Instance. Come up in time. I get an empty environment. So I don't have a classifier. Uh, so this is a quick and easy um, Power AI vision. We want to add a data set, and we're going to add it for image classification. See, there's also an option for 
uh, doing object detection. So we'll use it for this. I'm going to do it for cars. Uh, vehicle classifier. These actually don't make much difference what selection you make here because you still have to supply all the images to make it work anyway. Now it goes on and creates a container that's going to hold your data for you. Um, and then we will upload some images just to do some training. So add a category here. You pick the category. So this is for where you're wanting to detect different uh, sets of things. You can tell it, uh, show it representative images of, uh, in this case, we're going to use particular kinds of vehicles. Uh, that means that any image it looks at, it will be trying to detect the things it's been trained for. And it will have uh, levels of confidence and accuracy in detecting them. What it's not doing is object detection. It's just recognizing from the scene that it's been, put, that's been shown in the image how well it matches other scenes that has been shown and have been tagged with this category. So if I put in sedan cars, and it says, oh, you need to show me some images to do that. So I've got some here, and I will go to let's see some sedans. So I've got some images here that I can show. So I'm going to you see there's different kinds of vehicles, and they generally will have that sedan look, uh, but they'll be seen from different perspectives. So some that one obviously isn't a sedan, but we'll, we're going to put that one in as a, a fake. And these ones are hatchbacks. So I think I should avoid those ones. Those are hatches. But most of these are hatches. And these are sedans. So let's grab some sedans. We'll open those and now upload those. And you'll see those are the images it's going to use uh, to say this is what sedan pictures of sedans look like. And if we wanted to do so this comes down to what's your business need for doing this um, this could be looking for hospital cars in a hospital you want to look in a scene and see whether there's a gurney or uh, some uh, transport equipment or monitoring equipment in the right is it in the right place in the hospital just train it with the images that make sense uh, from a business purpose uh, in your environment. Let's grab a few trucks. Okay, it uploads those. All of these um, all of these images are, are available in the, the sample, which I'll, I'll show you in a second where I've kept all this. So you can try this on your own if you want. And then we'll do the last one here. Just for fun, we'll use golf carts. And there's golf carts. A whole load of golf carts. We'll upload, upload those, and you'll see. So the only processing that this uh, this environment can that only do, uh, can do is recognize uh, one or more of these three categories, or recognize that it's none of those. What it won't be able to tell you is is there a cat or a dog or monkeys or particular kinds of trees because it's not trained to do that. It's only trained to do these three things um, or detect that it's none of these three, none of these three things. You see that one? Uh, I think it's actually Donald Trump in a golf cart. Um, so now we've got, we've got some classifications to do. If you're trying this at home, uh, at this stage is where you export the images you've, you've uploaded because when it times out and goes away, um, you lose what you've been using as your, your classifier uh, data. So if you wanted to move it somewhere else, you'd have to keep the data you've loaded. I assume that's only when you're using the trial version. If you yes. keep the product, obviously, it doesn't go away. Well, the thing with the product is what you might find is you, you create a classifier, and then it's not that good. Um, and you want to add some more data. So you might want to create another classifier that uses the same set of images plus some more. 
Mm. So rather than keep a track of all the images that you've loaded into the first one and then go get them again, what you can do is export them periodically. Mm -hmm. and say, all right, so here's the set of images I use to train it to get this good. If I wanted to get better in, say, golf cart recognition, I could apply all the classifications I had before to this uh, importing from my, my uh, sort of like a checkpoint data set. Uh, and then add just more golf carts. If it gets better doing golf cart recognition, but not to the detriment of any of the other classifiers, now I can save that one. And I've got a my you know current good version of the, the training set. Uh, and that applies whether it's uh, the, the uh, trial version or the product. Uh, production version. Hmm. Yeah. So you can see how this could be used, say, in manufacturing, looking for faulty parts or damaged parts, or yes. all sorts of all sorts of use cases. So we've used it for uh, using a very simple classifier for doing rust detection um, on uh, drone surveys. So if you're a, you've got a drone and you're using it for doing inspection of either remote equipment or pipelines power lines um you know you've got to go in and inspect some things how do you prioritize your uh, your staff your equipment and your journey if you've got drone survey images and you can run a classifier that just says is it rusty or is it not um you can then use uh, some technology where you tile the images into very small ones and then uh, scan the image for whether it's rusty or not you don't really care what's in the image, just because uh, you know what your images are. They're pictures of the things you've taken um, your survey of. Uh, you can then run the, cert the uh, classifier just to say, is it rusty or not? And then you get an index for the overall image about how rusty things might be. Uh, and that gives you an idea of whether it's worth inspecting that particular thing um, as a priority versus any others. So you can apply whatever image um, classification you want and, and make it part of your business. As, you know, as you said, it could be for inspections, it could be for machine repairs, it could be for prioritizing uh, animal feedstock based on whether animals are coming into bonds or not. Uh, you can use it as a, a way of counting things. Uh, there's a, we've got some examples on our code patterns for doing things like counting fish. You can use that for figuring out whether you've got the right stock levels, you don't need to use it particularly for recognizing fish, just being able to count things that look like fish. So it doesn't need to be a very sophisticated set of images. It's just a, an indicator that you can use to make a business decision. Um, you don't necessarily need to understand uh, the underlying machine learning and AI uh, to be able to use it. And that's really the kind of emphasis of this. Um, so this particular one um, we could do for object uh, detection, and this will actually uh, do some sophisticated stuff. What we're using here is a classifier that just says, of all the other, all the things I've seen, where does it best match uh, existing images I've been trained on? Uh, I'll call it a switch car. We're using the data set. Um, you've got an option of how to train this. Do it fast. And you probably get you've got an expectation there that it's probably not going to be as accurate. Um, precision for us is get it as accurate as you can. And then another one is uh, if you really want to get in, you can create a customized training strategy, which is much more uh, where the data science models would kick in, and you could get much more fine-grained control of how it's going to do classification for you. But if you just use the uh, precise first, it's going to go off and build a model. It always says this. Um, it sometimes takes five minutes, sometimes 10. Um, I haven't yet had it take 16 minutes. Uh, if you cancel it, then it won't do it. So you really kind of have to say, yes, I'll, I'll do this. It's going to create a new task, and it'll start the training. So we're going to leave that for five minutes at least to chug away and do its thing. And then we'll come back. So over in our presentation land so just keep that in mind we've got we've got a, a url that we're going to invoke at some point which will invoke this trainer you'll see it's going to start doing the training and doing its own uh, self-testing and initially it starts out 
poor and then it gets better and better and better and then it gradually refines uh, convergence here. So you'll get better at recognizing um, and then it'll, it'll tend to oscillate for a while as it, as it gets better at one thing but at the expense of another. So it's going to chug away here. You see it's done uh, about 10% so far. 150 iterations and it's done about 160, 180 or so, so far. So let's switch over here and let that do its thing. At some point, we'll get to a test. We'll go back to that. So I'll show you uh, the Boston Cognitive Services. Uh, the, the quick and easy one we're going to do is language translation, but there's also the chatbot backend, which I'll show you. Okay. There's some demos that you can invoke that will show you how the, the Watson services work. But uh, can I have a very quick poll and see if anyone has not heard of Watson, IBM's Watson before? Send your answer into the chat window. Yeah, thank you. If you have heard of Watson, IBM Watson, or not. Well, I'm going to switch to over here. So what I'm going to do. To make a, a get access in the same way we've just got a, a Power AI Vision service instance running uh, in, in some cloud somewhere. I can't actually even tell you where it is. It's just in the cloud. Uh, we're going to go to the IBM cloud and uh, create an instance of a service that we can use for doing uh, language translation. Uh, so if you log into IBM cloud, you get a catalog of services. So this is pretty much uh, the common style for any of the major cloud providers. You get a catalog of services you can use. You get some information about them, and they're generally categorized. Uh, if we whittle these down, we're going to have a look at AI and the various services that are available. So these are things that you can consume directly uh, through APIs. There's Watson Assistant, which is the chatbot backend, language translation. Uh, speech to text. So this will take uh, an audio stream of uh, voice and convert it into the text equivalent. So it's closed captioning kind of generator. We've got text to speech. So it'll take text and convert it into a voice. Uh, so it's voice synthesis. Uh, visual recognition, which we'll be using shortly. And then there's some other tools to help you get going. What's in studio, a machine learning instance, so you can do your own uh, data science uh, with machine learning, deep learning, and some other kind of higher value things which process documents like the discovery tool, which goes in and will create context and um, build taxonomies automatically from uh, documents that you want to process. Right? And one that you may have seen at the bottom of that list was Power AI. So this allows you to sign up for the Power AI platform uh, with Nimbix, which is essentially what the um, AI Vision service is doing, but this gives you access to the entire Power AI uh, tool set, so you can go in and do your own uh, machine learning with Keras and TensorFlow and a whole bunch of other tools. Uh, if that doesn't uh, mean anything to you, you're not interested, and you just want to use the services, then these are the ones to get going. So we'll pick uh, language translation. I'll show you how we do this. This is just to create an instance for me. Um, these are the places that you can instantiate this service. So if you're concerned about sending data to the US and in, in Dallas by default, you can pick other places. You can pick Tokyo, Frankfurt. Frankfurt's our the European go-to place. And all of the services have a plan that tells you how much you might be charged for this if you use it. Um, there's a light plan for most of the services called light, which is free. That means you cannot incur any charges for this. You can only use up to the limit each month, uh, and then it will stop. So you won't get charged for it, but you can never be charged for it. But generally speaking, you can only have one instance of that. So you can have a free one, but you can only have one of them. If you need more, then you can pay, but you get, in some services, you get free layer. 
and then it'll start charging. Sometimes it charges straight off, uh, straight off the bat. Right. But we'll be using the light one here. So it's free. You can try this. You can try it free forever. So I'll create a free instance. You just say create one. And there is a big language translation service running in the cloud already. Uh, so all this is doing is just giving us a token that gives us access to be able to use it. And uh, because I'm already using another light client, just because of the way my account works, it says I've got some uh, less than the, the 100,000 to use because I've already consumed a bit. Right. Ross, but, yeah. Perhaps this is a good uh, question to take at the moment. Is, sure. Um, so somebody's uh, asking me privately, what role does IBM I play in using Power AI and Bluemix or Watson as, as you showed uh, yeah, here? So, so, how does it link back? So how does it link back? The, the IBM I instance that we've shown, that node red that's running here, is able to call out to those services. So IBM I used to have uh, some services where you could kind of off the shelf um, uh, knowledge based systems tools and AI tools. Um, you, there was a, a product called Knowledge Tool, which ran on um, in the old days AS400, OS400, uh, right up until I think 5.2, I guess, until it disappeared. And that was what was called a production rules system. So you could create expert systems with it and they ran natively on uh, on IBM I. Um, there were a couple of others that you could get from third parties that would run um, AI. And there was also an IBM product called uh, the Neural Network Utility, which is essentially what the, a lot of the deep learning technologies are. And unfortunately, ne Neural Network Utility, um, it lasted for a while, but it um, the environment on, on IBM I at the time was not the greatest for uh, doing what I've just been doing with say, AI Vision, just to spin up uh, some some tools. And generally speaking, uh, IBM I machines tend not to have GPUs attached to them. So what's happened over time is uh, more and more machine learning type environments have used, uh, relied on GPUs to accelerate what they do and make them um, Access, much more accessible generally. Uh, but what you find is the IBM I hardware generally won't have the GPUs on them. So what we're, we're doing here is using the services that are available on uh, either the cloud, so essentially infinitely scalable, uh, or other services that can be um, brought up with um, the right kind of hardware. Um, in this case, um, Power AI running uh, on Power Linux. Uh, I'm not sure whether there's any uh, drive going on where you could natively access GPUs. And if there was a way of doing it, it'd be through PACE. Um, I'm pretty sure nobody's done a, a port test of AI, Power AI within PACE. But, uh, no, I, I don't <laughs> think that's the case. Um, I, I think, uh, as you were saying, the Power AI running on GPU accelerated systems such as the AC92. Yeah. But um, if you're doing some model training and you have uh, the ability to uh, have an API that you can call your data maybe on IBM I, so you're marrying up the two yeah. uh, in that way. Yeah, so the idea here is to show that you can integrate with these services that are growing on the cloud, growing with third parties, and be able to exploit them um, within your applications on IBM I. So it's not just hosting a, a Node-RED application. What I'm going to show you in, in a minute or two is how you can actually invoke that locally through, um, I'm not an RP, no longer an RPG programmer, so I'm doing it with CL. But you can invoke it through a CL program to uh, call the services that the Node-RED integration is doing for you. So here, where I've got a browser talking to Node-RED, I'm also going to add, oh, I'll see, to paste me one there. I'll just add a new one. Oh, 
the basic. Oh, I mean, I must have the slideshow running somewhere. Yeah. We switch to the slideshow. It's called caught up in a uh, slideshow hell here. The the idea here that the node red is running on on the IBM I, we can access it through a browser, but we can also just as easily access that through um, CL, RPG, COBOL, um, Java, uh, all running on the, the IIS app. So I'll show you that in a second. So the idea is we're going to use this translator and invoke it from an application within the IBM I environment. So you get the use of all of the cloud services um, within your application, but you don't have to make your application um, become a language translator. You don't have to build it to do it. You don't have to maintain that. That can be uh, provided through the, the cloud services. That sound okay? Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Thank you. And we will take uh, more questions, but we may do them at the end in the interest of time because uh, Ross yeah. still has a, a few more things to show. He's bringing it all together yeah. um, in, in the next few bits. So okay. bear with us. All right. So that that's the Power AI Vision thing has finished doing its training. So we'll do a quick deploy. So when we deploy this, it now creates a web service instance, which is here. So I'll just do a quick test. Let's take one of these images. Here's a golf cart. And it's come up as 99.985% sure that it's this is a golf cart, um, which you'd expect because it knows about golf carts. I think if I was to create one of the pickup trucks and do that, it's slightly less confident, but it's pretty sure it's a pickup truck. Right, so you get the idea that this thing can classify images. Uh, here's an image that isn't any of those. But it should say, yes, it's pretty much 100% sure it is not one of the three things it's been trained on, uh, which again, hopefully is, is not unexpected. That's what you would want. So this will only recognize those three things we've trained it on. Uh, now to make this work, we need this classifier ID. And I'll put that into my little holding area here. I'll need that in a second. That's the instance of the, the endpoint that we're going to call. And let me switch back over here, over in the IBM Cloud. They generally, if we're creating this translator, we, we, we created our service instance, and we need an API key to be able to invoke this. So I'll show you this. We're going to take that one, the API key. And then uh, this is in Frankfurt, so we'll see whether this works. Take that API key. We'll switch back over to the node red instance that we were working on. And we'll see just a nice simple one here. Here's a translate. Here's the API key. We have to put it in here. And we're going to go to Frankfurt. Do that. And I've got it set so that it will translate whatever I put in. It's going to assume is in English, and it will convert it to Dutch, just because it's uh, reasonably recognizable uh, from my perspective, anyway. Um, so what this is going to do? You put some text in uh, to this uh, endpoint. It's going to take the text from the query push it into the translate node, translate that into Dutch, and then respond with it. So we can deploy that. So now without me knowing anything really about how language translation goes, I've got uh, a message here I want to convert into Dutch in this case. And there's my Dutch equivalent of the message that I sent him. And then it gives you a bunch of information too about the uh, the translation that was going on, how many words, and so on. And that that word count and character count is relevant to how much you'll be 
eventually charged if you were using a chargeable service as well. So you can keep a track of things and say, now that I've translated it, unless the text changes, it's always going to be the same translation. So I can now keep that, for example, in the message library. So you could use a way of saying, whenever I need to translate something the first time, I'll call the service. Once I've got it, I can now create a message library for it. Uh, and then if someone else uses this, the same kind of uh, I need to generate the same kind of text, I can just use the cache that I've got to create a little library on the fly. So we have the what's in service. We put translate. And we want to say some text that we want to translate. It needs to be escaped. Uh, what I'll do is uh, hello. Uh, the percent to zero is a space. Are you there we go. Question mark that will mess things up. So on the fly um, Dutch translation of text uh, without me having to do anything. So over in IBMI world. Old school here. So here's a OCL program. It's going to take some text. Uh, you're very old fudge for getting the, the length of the text. Uh, so I can scan it and put in the appropriate escape characters for spaces and apostrophes and so on. So it'll take the text, convert it into uh, an escaped version. Not completely robust, but it will do. Then I'm going to call you shall and invoke the curl command. Tell it that I want to call the web service that I've just shown you you can call from the browser, but actually do an HTTP request to it. Do a translate, put the text in that's been escaped. And then put the data back into a data queue so that we can uh, read it back out from the, the local application. So it creates the data queue. Of the queue shall not await. By the way, it will, it will try and show you how clever it's been by invoking the command. Um, and then come back out here and receive the data back into the application. All right. So now. Show you what that looks like. So if I were to do call HTTP query, say I want to put um, every everybody it looks like might be with a bit of luck, if this works, you should see a message uh, appear at the bottom of the end because it will be the send program message of the translated text, which it doesn't. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. So what we can do is this. Uh, uh, after apologize, that was one of those. Well, it worked a minute ago. Let's see what's in here. the whole thing so we can go out found that the text, keeping it all right into the 
Uh, yeah. It should be it should be doing that, and then it sends off. It's done some extra keeping, which is me messing things around just before we do it. So if I go into uh, HL, I'll do a little cheat over here. I have one I made earlier. So this is invoking the, the same thing. But passing the data back into here. So I can do a data queue minus R HTTP response. There's my uh my Dutch translation of it's my birthday today. So you can invoke that from the application. And I apologize, I broke the CL version. Let's get back to the node red one where we've got our vision recognition. So let's assume that you can go off and create a, a vision recognition version as the same as you can with uh, a translate and you get a key to do this. So you'll see there's an API key for talking to visual recognition. And we're also going to hook into the AI vision. And this is the one where we're going to need the host information that I've got and the service information, which I need to put in here. And that's come from that copy that we did from these guys. So here's my service ID. And there's the host. I can now deploy that. So that's now been updated. So what I'll show you is this whole chat service going, which is this one. And we can browse for images. Here's an image of Mini. So this app, this is again your IBMI. So this is this web page is being created and maintained by IBMI. So it's not using PHP or anything. It's all based in code inside Node Red. And now we'll run the classifier service. And if we look over in the debug window, you'll see we've got uh, services being invoked. We're getting Power AI Vision being called with a bit of luck. We'll have this information, which has come back from the Watson vision recognition system. And Power AI has returned its result and says it's a pickup, and it's about 90% sure it's a pickup. Ah, you can see it's not a pickup car, but that means uh, we need to do some training. It's recognized it's not a sedan, it's not a golf cart. It recognizes it's a vehicle, then its closest match will be a pickup. So if we wanted to do hatchbacks, we could create a new category add it into the classifier and say, we've got a category of now hatchbacks, add them in, and it would be more accurate. But then you are, you're having to figure out whether it's worth doing that or not. Okay. Just as a, a bit of interest, the information up here is, um, let's do store opening times. This is using the chatbot service, which again, you, you can get to from the Watson catalog. So if Watson Assistant, you do the same thing, you create an instance of it, and then you can train it in uh, creating a chatbot backend. This application has got the same thing in here. We've created an instance, we give it a key, and then we've got uh, a chatbot capability all built into the application and all of the uh, the templating and the HTML is coming directly from inside Node Red. So this actually generates all of the web pages. It's got the uh, the parser, it loads up the images, does the preview for you, 
creates it all inside the uh, the Node Red application. And then this, depending on what you ask, it will do some uh, translation on the fly. You'll see it had a, an option to translate the response into one of these languages. So you can switch dynamically and say, uh, let's go opening times again. Oh, uh, well, should, unless it's to do with stores, it should go off and come back with a French conversion. But it's not doing it for me today. And then, last but not least, IoT. You'll see that the ability to create uh, IoT services, you just have to add in an extra little bit to do IoT. Um, and you'll find in the um, in the PDF for the, the talk today, there's information about how you set that up. It's the same sort of thing. You create your, your <laughs> create your nodes and install them and drag them in and, and format data to send off. And again, we can send off a, a URL here for doing IoT. So this can generate IoT data. Um, we all have something like temperature equals 50. Uh, let's go brightness. Okay, that kind of thing. And some data. Now uh, that is in the application. I'll get some debug. And you can see where it's having a bit of a fit is because I haven't put quotes around the, the data in the right place. But it's generating a message which you can send off. This one is going to send off uh, information for humidity. So I need to put humidity into the response. So I'll add some humidity equals 56 and The last one that it wanted was a timestamp. There's the data sending temperature, humidity, and a, a timestamp. And that has now been published out to the IBM Internet of Things, which is available on, again, for free. There's a thing called Quick Start Internet of Things. And I'm using IIC IBM RDC as the device ID. So if I go back here and push again, We should get data being published directly to it. So if the page is loading, perhaps not finished loading yet. Okay. So all of the stuff that I've been showing you before we run out of time uh, is available on this GitHub repository in our IBM Code London, Node Red for AI flows. There's a whole load of stuff here about how to do what I've been showing you. But there's a section specifically here to do with IBMI. So you've got the how to do your, all of the stuff to install using YUM, um, prepping the Node Red environment using Cloud Object Store if you want, using the IDB connector for DB2 for I, and how to launch Node Red. And you'll see the uh, the startup there for uh, launching it and then it takes if you wanted to do what i've just been doing there's a sample node red configuration which you can import to get going we've got because it's node red 
any of the uh, labs that we've got in here to do with IoT or chatbots, you can pick up on. So you'll see this um, uh, IoT 101s, Node Red with IoT, uh, there's chatbots. Uh, any of the things that are Node Red will take you into things that you can do on the IBM I because you can install the, the nodes appropriately on IBM I. Still Ross, not I, assume, I assume the links to the the material you just showed are um, on the slide deck. Yes, they are. And when we publish the replay and the slide deck, you will be able to just click on those links and uh, yeah. get loads of information on how to get yeah. started and, and use the things that Ross has been showing you. Exactly. Uh, let's see if I can find it there. The links are at the bottom. There we go. So you see there's GitHub and uh, IBM.com. For some reason, it's gone out of display mode and I can't get it back into slideshow mode. Um, yeah, all the information's there where where the IBM I library is, uh, the GitHub IBM uh, Code London for all of the stuff around uh, Node Red and that uh, section, particularly on uh, the IBM I implementation. Okay. Uh, the the information about AI vision is current at the moment. It seems to come and go, but the the trial program is there for you to uh, exploit as it currently stands. Okay. So where are we? Back to here. Yeah. All right. So uh, as I said, local application running on uh, the machines. Uh, you can invoke those as services within your application and. Um, Oh, it's not I've shown you that CL program, but I've obviously broken it. Again, but um, invoking it through uh, URL locally means you don't need in your in an RPG program or a CL program all you, uh, to know where the service is uh, being created. All you need to know is what the local endpoint is. So if it's being run as a URL here, you can use Node-RED to integrate to extra third-party services, bring them together, and your apps locally only know that they're making a call to a local service. So you kind of hide all the implementation, integrate with Node-RED, and then make it available to local apps. Um, I'd love to know what I broke to make that not work anymore, but I'll fix that after the work after the workshop. Uh, it was working great till nine o'clock this morning. Um, I'll, I'll dig into that. Okay. So if you've got questions, you know, send messages to me. You can uh, do whatever you like, really. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and um, we can publish uh, any details that you find out after mm. after the um, today's session is uh, completed. Uh, sure. We can publish um, little links or uh, helpful hints or, or whatever is required. So. Great, sure. thank you. Um, Ross, that's been a, a whirlwind uh, tour of uh, so many different topics, uh, all related to IBM I, so thank you a lot. Um, there are some questions. We will take them in a little while, mm -hmm. so please stay on. Um, yes. And just in case anyone does need to log uh, off out of this uh, session, um, I will be setting up new sessions on the webinar series in the new year now. So this is the last session of this year. I thank you for joining all the different sessions that you may have done over this year and over the last few years and I hope you have uh, happy holidays. So we will stay on, but I'm going to stop the recording um, at this time. So thanks again for joining, and we'll continue with them, some questions. Terrific. Thank you all, uh, and, and thanks for bearing with me. And uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, if you do try out the workshop uh, materials that are here, you can raise issues with them in comments uh, through the normal GitHub process. Just add in questions here. Um, if you find something wrong, which you almost certainly would, um, let me know and we'll fix it for you.